Right, hi everybody. Uh, welcome back to another installment uh, of the political history of modern Japan. And today I'm going to be talking about uh, the politics of remilitarization in Japan. Um, <clears throat> many times uh, people from the outside will, and people inside Japan as well, will look at um, uh, the, the self-defense forces in Japan, and then they'll say, well, this is, this is an army. It clearly looks like an army, and Japan has one of the largest defense uh, or military budgets uh, in the world <clears throat> today. So it seems to have a quite formidable um, military force and presence in the region. But at the same time, uh, it has the uh, quite famous uh, Article 9 of its constitution, which uh, forbids uh, the country from holding uh, military forces from having an army and a navy or an air force, and um, forbids the country from uh, um, waging war as a means to solve uh, international disputes. So there seems to be this uh, you know, contradiction, and sometimes it seems kind of hard to explain. Um, so I'll get into some of that today and some of the reasons for that uh, as well. And I just want to state from the beginning as well that, um, you know, I'm not a foreign policy uh, expert on Japan, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a modern historian, um, but when I approach these issues, um, what I basically do is just try to draw on uh, a wide range of, of scholarship and some of the most recent scholarship and try to summarize that. And today, um, I'm really drawing from a lot of different uh, articles and books. I'll point out some of them in the lecture, but um, I won't be able to, to mention uh, all, of, all of my uh, sources um, up front. I mean, I cite them uh, in, in the talk and in the PowerPoint, but I won't be able to spend a lot of time, you know, introducing each, uh, one of them. Um, <clears throat> but basically this is, you know, how I approach, um, this subject and especially a subject that, um, you know, I've always been very aware of and interested in, um, but have never really attempted to, you know, um, delve into in a, in a particularly, uh, scholarly way. Um, so anyway, um, but I'm pretty happy with, with the results that of today's talk, and uh, I, I found a lot of the sources that I drew from to be quite illuminating, and I hope that comes out in the talk, and I hope that uh, through this talk I'm able to clarify um, maybe some of these uh, lingering questions in people's minds, such as the one that I mentioned um, just a minute ago, you know, um, how can Japan have what seems to be um, a pretty large army, but at the same time have a constitution which forbids uh, having such uh, a force? Okay, so <clears throat> let's get into it. And title of my talk, uh, as I as I already mentioned, is uh, the politics of remilitarization, uh, Japan and the SDF. This would be self-defense forces. Um, and I want to start off just by looking at the history of the self-defense forces and then, um, you know, covering this from their founding up and up through the post-war um, until the present uh, day. And in this section, I'm drawing a lot from a book by David Hunter Chester called Creating Japan's Ground Self-Defense Force 1945 to 2015. And, um, you know, the, the author himself has fairly close links to um, the SDF, and um, I would say, you know, he, he does a very, I think, um, well-researched uh, and, and detailed and very enlightening history of the SDF. Um, at the same time, one thing that I was aware of as I was um, you know, drawing from the source was uh, that he does, you know, basically try to paint a pretty positive picture of 
of the SDF and of the U.S.-Japan uh, military alliance. Um, you know, make of that what you will. Um, there are probably other books on this subject in English. I don't know, but this is just one that I found to be the most detailed. So uh, I'm going to be going mostly from that uh, in these first few slides. So there were fierce debates during the period of U.S. occupation uh, amongst U.S. Uh, leaders and Japanese leaders as to whether Japan, um, you know, should be disarmed and for how long. And Matsumoto Joji uh, proposed changes. He was one of the people that was kind of pioneering um, constitutional revision and, and, you know, writing a new um, uh, constitutional draft for the post-war. And he proposed some changes from the Me Meiji Constitution um, you know, changing the terms army and navy and just referring to them as armed forces, for instance, um, and he stressed civilian control. But uh, some U.S. leaders felt that this wasn't enough. It didn't go far enough. U.S. Brigadier uh, General Courtney Whitney, for instance, found that these were not enough, and he thought they were too close to the old Meiji Constitution. Um, so uh, Foreign Minister, who was former Foreign Minister Shidehara, uh, then suggested to uh, General Douglas MacArthur uh, that, well, you know, maybe Japan should renounce the war and give up military arms entirely. And he, this actually found quite a bit of support amongst MacArthur himself um, and Whitney, whom I mentioned. And kind of based on this uh, idea, then SCAP produced an early draft of the Constitution with um, what then... Uh, morphed into uh, what is today Article 9. And the early drafts of U.S. drafts of Article 9 forbid, forbid the military from even engaging in self-defense. Now, a lot of the debates that took place after that within the Japanese diet were focused on, you know, does Japan have the right to self-defense? And the kind of, um, you know, tentative conclusion or unstated conclusion that was agreed upon um, basically was that, well, yes, it does. Um, and there, it's not, but it is a little bit ambiguous. It's not clearly spelled out. <laughs> but later drafts deleted this wording. Um, you know, does it give, does it forbid war potential? Or, but it does forbid war potential then, which gives rise to uh, some debates. You know, what does this mean? What does, what does potential to wage war mean? So there's some ambiguity here from the beginning. The Japanese press was welcoming but skeptical and cautious of the cons of Article Nine, especially of the style of dearmament. Um, but MacArthur, uh, especially in the early stages, and personally defended uh, Article Nine um, quite vigorously. And then Matsumoto later, um, you know, got on board with this, and he tried to assure um, the Privy Council, which was still around in the early stages of, of the occupation, uh, that. Uh, self-defense was permissible. So, you know, lots of kind of old elite conservatives on the Privy Council, and they, many of them wanted to, you know, didn't want to disband the military in the first place. So Matsumo, so they needed some reassuring, basically. Um, actually, the members of the Diet and the House of Representatives from all parties were much more critical of Article 9. They argued for the need to self-defense and uh, argued to change the wording. Um, and one of the defenders of uh, Article 9 and of the Constitution, um, but Article 9 especially, was Prime Minister Yoshida himself. Um, and he had kind of a complicated relationship with um, Article 9 and with Japan's wartime past. You know, he had been imprisoned by the military during the war for a while. So, but at the same time, um, he was... Uh, kind of conservative, liberal, old-school liberal, um, who basically did feel that, um, you know, it was the right of liberal nations to have um, armies, and uh, this was a sovereign right. But in Japan's case, you know, he was cautious of, of this and of the wartime history because of the wartime history in particular. So he um, asserted that Article 9, you know, it doesn't deny the right to self-defense, but he stated that it is important symbolically um, to renounce even this, you know, even 
self-defense to really to strongly symbolically renounce militarism basically um because all of japan's modern wars up to that point had been fought in the name of self-defense i think this is a really uh you know astute argument and it demonstrates a great grasp of um of modern japanese history so um i think i think this is a really a kind of um you know was a was a very good way to to argue things um at that time interestingly you know today the japanese communist party is a would be a strong defender of article 9 at that time the leader of the japanese communist party nosaka sanzo um was against article 9 he argued that um japan needed the right to uh, exercise self defense um so you know we see some changes in in thinking here eventually over time but early on this is how people initially felt um the wording of article 9 then changed through various diet revisions some in the diet picked up on the fact that once Japan had joined the UN Charter, that its right to self-defense would be guaranteed. And the UN guarantees this as a right of sovereign nations. Um, other debates concern the use of the word forever, uh, renounce, to renounce militarism forever, renounce right of war forever, etc. Um, you know, what, what do these things mean? Like, um, because, you know, it's forever, forever. <laughs> like, I mean... <clears throat> There, there's a bit of ambiguity here, right? Um, and but Hunter Chester says the consensus the consensus in America in 1946 was arguably Japan must be kept permanently disarmed. In Japan, at the same time, many accepted this as inevitable and some as relief. Well, that's a pretty you know accurate, concise statement I think for summing up how people generally perceived this. However, many in the U.S. government disapproved of this from the beginning, and their voices grew much stronger over the next few years, um, to the point where eventually the U.S. is the strongest uh, opponent of Article 9 and the strongest proponent of arguing to revise Article 9. So it is a complete shift in U.S. thinking. But from the beginning, that opposition to Article 9 was apparent. This included former Ambassador Joseph Grew, um, political advisor George At Atchison, um, and there's also a shift in the U.S. media as well with the onset of the Cold War especially. Um, George Kennan also argued for Japan to establish a police force to resist, quote, uh, communist subver subversion, in his words. Um, so there's this idea that, you know, this there's definitely a shared uh, joint hatred of um, communism and left-wing thought in general, um, you know, from long before the war on both sides. And then as well now that the U.S. is looking to kind of offset the burden of protecting Japan so that it can focus on fighting uh, the Cold War um, as well. There's this other motivation for the U.S. to push for Japan's uh, remilitarization. Uh, then... Um, the, this should be, uh, I think, Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, so, or uh, Joint Security Council, maybe, yeah. So the, the JSC uh, declared in April of uh, 1947 uh, that Japan should revive its military potential. So already from 1947, um, the highest organs of the U.S. state were arguing that Japan should, um, you know, remilitarize. And among Japanese and U.S. elites, as I mentioned, there had long been a fear of communism and the idea that Japan should keep an army to uh, ward off the left wing. Uh, Konoe um, Fumimoto, for instance, uh, feared left wing thought within the Imperial Japanese Army during the war. So within the Japanese Army, even, um, you know, some Japanese leaders feared the rise of left wing thought. Major Ge uh, General Charles Willoughby of G2, this is like the um, kind of uh, uh, like top secret intelligence agency within uh, the uh, general headquarters of the U.S. occupation, tried to keep alive elements of the old Imperial Japanese Army and to prep for Jap Japan to rearm. He worked with General Arisui, Arisue Seizo, 
uh, former head of the Japanese military intelligence and other former military officers, including Colonel Hattori Takushiro, uh, to come up with detailed plans for reviving the army. And all of them shared this, uh, you know, virulently uh, anti, should be communist uh, sentiment. But Article 9, when it was released, um, it read like this, uh, aspiring sincerely to an international peace based on justice and order, the Japanese people forever renounce war as a sovereign right of the nation and the threat or use of force as means of settling international disputes. In order to accomplish the aim of the preceding paragraph, land, sea, and air forces, as well as other war potential, uh, will never be maintained. The right of belligerency of the state will not be recognized. You know, but what is war potential? Again, this is a bit ambiguous. Um, and forever renounce uh, war. You know, they, they renounce war, like they say they won't do it, but, you know, what does renounce mean? How legally binding is this? In what way? Etc. So there's some, uh, you know, ambiguity here. And, and basically the consensus emerges that this does allow for self-defense. Um, but the Japan Socialist Party, for instance, and others, um, you know, maintain for a very long time until the early 1990s that um, the self-defense forces are uh, illegal, that Article 9 uh, did not allow for self-defense. So, you know, there are, there was debate for a very long time and, and it is because of this ambiguity. I mean, I don't know, when I read this, um, you know, just as a layperson, uh, it seems pretty clear to me that, um, that, you know, this would include anything like the self-defense, which is so clearly, uh, you know, a, a military force. But I don't know, I mean, there's uh, different ways to interpret this, obviously, and debate continues, as we will see, uh, you know, up until the present day. Um, Okay, so then continuing on with the history of, and background of the SDF. Um, so, as I mentioned, then Prime Minister Yoshida was kind of like a reluctant overseer of Japan's rearmament. He, he was mainly concerned with what was known as the Yoshida Doctrine, which is reviving Japan economically while benefiting from U.S. military protection. Uh, and he wanted to maintain public support as well as to ensure that Japan regained its independence eventually, which it did in 1952. Against the background of the Korean War in 1950, MacArthur and Yoshida um, oversaw the creation of the National Police Reserve, a force of 75,000, uh, which was basically, it says police, but it was a, a paramilitary uh, organization. And this is the um, kind of, uh, this is the beginnings of the self-defense forces. There was a great tension within the NPR since they had to live down the negative legacies of the Imperial Japanese Army even when some of its own members were former military uh, people. Uh, the main purpose of the NPR was to replace U.S. Army divisions that had left for uh, the Korean War. And there was also a conflict within um, the Japanese government and SCAB. Um, Willoughby and some other right-wingers wanted to install former uh, Japanese Army officers into the National Police Re Reserve. They argued that the Japanese Communist Party was trying to infiltrate the police reserve. And uh, as I mentioned, the NPR basically at this time, the fact that it was a paramilitary organization was basically kept secret. Um, but they're, they're unable to escape of a lot of this overlap with the Imperial Japanese Army and the legacies of the Imperial Japanese Army. So from the beginning, for instance, they established their headquarters at the former Imperial Japanese Army headquarters uh, in places of, of former headquarters such as at uh, in Etajima, uh, which is in, in the Inland Sea, uh, and on other bases. In popular society, um, many people embraced unarmed neutrality. However, some on the white right wanted rearmament, and there were two different camps within the right wing. Um, one sought greater Japanese independence, while the other sought closer relationship with the U.S. Um, I guess both of these tendencies kind of exist today. However, this one here, uh, the former one, has basically completely faded into the background so that now the Japanese right wing 
is mainly just, you know, incredibly pro United States, um, even to the point where they form alliances with right wingers in the United States. Um, Meanwhile, Yoshida tried to negotiate a peace treaty with the U.S. while still maintaining close relations in the post-war system, and he proposes a peace treaty with U.S. bases in Japan, um, which is basically the form, what exactly what happened. And Dulles and others in the U.S. accepted this while also wanting Japan to rearm, but Yoshida was more reluctant on this point. Um, rearmament was also a hard sell to other U.S. allies like Australia and the Philippines, were strongly opposed to a remilitarized Japan. Thus, when the peace treaty came out, the San Francisco Peace Treaty in 1952, it came as a package with um, the U.S.-Japan uh, Security Treaty, the Anzen Hosho Joyaku, uh, which we've talked about in earlier lectures, um, so that one, so that many saw this as a quote uh, incomplete sovereignty, and this is. Uh, uh, Sorry, I forgot the name of the author. Um, Hunter Chester's uh, quote here is an incomplete sovereignty. There was also a struggle over what Japan's post-war identity should be. Was it a pacifist nation, or should it be called? Should it become a so-called quote normal nation? Um, and the security treaty called for Japan to quote increasingly assume responsibility for its own defense. So already again from the beginning then. Um, as I mentioned, in 1947, the uh, Security Council in the U.S. wanted to um, uh, wanted Japan to remilitarize, and it made that very clear. Um, and you know, it's stated, it's implied in the 1952 Security Treaty as well that Japan's going to take more of a role for its own defense. And then in 1953, Vice President, president uh, Richard Nixon, who was vice president at this time, called for Japan to assume primary responsibility for its defense. And he even went so far as to say that it was a mistake to disarm Japan and write Article 9. So there's this consensus basically in Washington and among Japanese elites that uh, the Constitution needs to be revised and Japan needs to remilitarize. However, the main opposition to this is popular opposition in Japan and support for Article 9. The U.S. pressured Japan to revise the Constitution to pay more for its defense and rearmament. Uh, some of the debates had to do with numbers. How big should the new Japan uh, defense forces be, since this related to cost, too? Eventually, the new SDF was authorized at a strength set at 180,000, which it reached in 1960. The Self-Defense Agency Law and Self-Defense Force Law passed in July. Sorry, lots of spelling errors in this. Don't know how my spell checker missed that, but it happens. Uh, in 1954, Hatoyama Ichido uh, took over after Yoshida eventually, and he was a strong proponent of rearmament as well. Um, and Later, he was replaced by Prime Minister Kishi, who we've uh, looked at in more detail in earlier lectures. The U.S. was very hopeful about Kishi, thinking that they had found in him uh, someone whom they could work with to rearm Japan. And Kishi initially, initially hoped to build up the self-defense forces to the point that they could replace U.S. forces. Uh, but uh, this, of course, did not uh, come to pass. And Kishi illustrates some of the contradictions uh, inherent within the right wing in Japan and the LDP. Uh, which is that they're both subservient to the U.S. while at the same time seeking to make Japan uh, stronger militarily. Ideologically, the new SDF struggled to craft its identity. The U.S. blamed Japanese militarism on, quote, feudalistic thought. Uh, and this is part of what a thinking at the time known as modernization theory that was popular among U.S. Uh, elites as they tried to um, export U.S.-led liberal democracy and capitalism around the world. Um, they uh, and, and a group of scholars uh, associated with U.S. Uh, uh, policy planners and elites uh, attempted to portray U.S.-style liberal democracy as the um, as basically the best and most modern quote modern form of of uh, governance in order to convince uh, other developing and newly decolonialized nations to adopt the U.S. and not the Sino-Soviet model. Uh, and in that framework, 
um, those same leaders blamed uh, the causes for World War II in Japan on an inability to properly, quote, modernize. And now this theory, this modernization theory, has com been completely discredited and debunked, um, but nevertheless, um, this is how many, uh, especially elites in Washington, thought at the time. And so they would brandish about this term uh, feudalistic or feudalism, etc., like that, for these what they saw as old, outdated, outmoded, antiquated forms of thinking and government. So they came up with oaths for NPR members, which they had to recite and which stated that members would obey and defend the Constitution and laws, etc., to kind of, you know, um, stress these uh, ideals to liberal democracy, etc., and loyalties. Uh, after 1954, an additional provision was added where recruits say they wouldn't participate in political activities. Um, moreover, the idea of Bushido is, was changed from loyalty to one's lord to welfare of the country, justice, humanity, etc., things like this. Uh, Japan could be said to have faced a similar situation to post-war Germany, uh, in West Germany, how to distinguish the new army from the old. And the idea emerged that the army... Uh, stood up for, it was the role of the army to stand up for value, the values of the state, which of course are supposed to be, in this time, uh, democratic. There was also a focus on cultivation of the self, rather than just following orders blindly, top-down, you know, giving, or, giving and following orders and harsh discipline. And the idea of uh, kokoro gamae was emphasized as the new organizing principle. This included uh, individual development and stressing a, quote, proper sense of patriotism. However, in 1957, a JSDF commander during nighttime exercises beat soldiers who moved too slowly with bamboo canes, and two soldiers died in this uh, uh, as a result. So, you know, there, there are still these very strong links to the former Imperial Japanese Army and their methods of disciplining. Um, moreover, uh, enthusiasm for the SDF was very low in popular society in 1958, a survey of high school students showed that hardly anyone wanted to join the SDF, and the JSP, as I mentioned, the Japan Socialist Party, refused to recognize the constitutionality uh, of the self-defense forces uh, until the early 1990s. Um, Nakasone uh, emerged as a uh, Nakasone Yasudio emerged as a strong constitutional revisionist. Um, he eventually became prime minister, of course, uh, as we'll see in a minute. But um, before this, he was director general of the Defense Agency in 1970. And he called for a, quote, a more autonomous defense, Jishu Boe. He sought to, a buildup of the SDF that would have cost twice as much as the current amount. However, the fiscal oil crisis in the 1970s made this mostly impossible. But uh, as the Cold War kind of... Um, was renewed in the 1980s. There was a, a strengthening of the U.S.-Japan uh, Security Alliance, and U.S.-Japan Defense Cooperation Guidelines were drawn up in 1978, which led to increased joint planning and exercises. Uh, when Nakasone was prime minister, he gave his support to this, uh, including the first bilateral exercise in 1980 with the U.S. Army at Camp Zama in Kanagawa. And regular exercises between the two um, forces continued after this. There was also growing support for the SDF from around this time. In 1980, four out of five Diet members supported expansion of the SDF. Uh, in 1983, Nakasone called uh, the security relationship with the U.S. Uh, an alliance, and Japan is America's, quote, unsinkable aircraft carrier. And this is a kind of famous quote, you know, um, Nakasone being a staunch uh, conservative uh, in Japan, uh, kind of very, you know, up to that point, very kind of typical uh, thinking. He represents typical thinking in the LDP, but it, it illustrates, I think, some of these uh, inherent inconsistencies within the LDP and within Japanese right-wing conservative thought itself, um, which basically bends over backwards to do whatever the United States wants, while at the same time, uh, trying to portray Japan as being very strong and independent in the process. And so his quote of Japan as an unsinkable aircraft carrier in the Pacific for the United States Army really illustrates this. 
He also advocated the idea that the SDF could go out, uh, could go to U.S. aid or come to U.S. aid outside of Japan's territorial waters. And this will come up again, as we'll see in the case of uh, Prime Ministers Koizumi and Abe later. He abrogated the 1% GDP defense spending limit. Um, up to that point, defense spending could only comprise up to 1% of Japan's total uh, annual GDP. Nakasone also advocated sending minesweeping missions to the Middle East, uh, this later happened as well, uh, to defend oil interests. Then the 1990-1991 Gulf War broke out, uh, and at this time uh, Prime Minister Kaifu tried to find ways to support the war, but ended up um, sending about 13 billion, later a figure of 15 billion dollars is cited, but I'll just say between 13 and 15 billion. Uh, this was one of the largest of any single country donating to help the U.S. in its uh, war efforts. Um, but the U.S. still criticized Japan for not actually sending physical troops to fight in the war. Uh, Prime Minister Kaifu tried to make up for this by sending minesweepers once the conflict was over in 1991. And then he changed the laws to allow for the SDF to participate in United Nations peacekeeping operations in 1992. During the Gulf War, Ozawa Ichido, uh, who was a member of the LDP at that time, but later would emerge as a leader of the new opposition um, Democratic Party of Japan, is thought of as kind of a typical, um, typical. he represents the, the thought of the Democratic Party in Japan and liberal thought in Japan in general. He argued for direct uh, self-defense participation. Um, he also called for a, quote, positive and active pacifism. I think this is really interesting and important because this is picked up later by uh, Abe Shinzo when he becomes prime minister um, and it's frequently attributed to Abe Shinzo but in fact it originates with Ozawa Ichido who um, was at the time this was really adopted as Japanese policy was a member of the opposition with the DPJ um, and a quote international collective security. In 1993, Ozawa wrote a blueprint for a new Japan where he argued to make Japan a, quote, normal state. And what normal state means is a normal is a state that uh, include that has a standing uh, army. In 1994, uh, the Socialist Party under Murayama, under Murayama, when he was prime minister, uh, changed their longstanding position, uh, saying the SDF was unconstitutional, he changed this to say that it was constitutional. He had formed part of a, um, a coalition government with uh, the LDP, with the main, uh, his main opponents, and part of forming that, getting their support, was recognizing the constitutionality of the SDF. So now all major parties accepted the constitutionality of the SDF. In the 1995 Hanshin Awaji earthquake, the SDF played a major role in rescue efforts, but these efforts were still criticized for being too slow. So after this, the laws were revised to make it easier for the SDF to do disaster relief. By 1995, most um, people in Japan associated the SDF with disaster relief and support, uh, and support for the SDF, as a result, grew to a new high. Um, <clears throat> however, there were many problems that came to be um, seen, as we've already seen. There, there was a uh, Periods in Japanese history has been strong opposition to the U.S.-Japan uh, Security Treaty and Military Alliance. This was renewed in 1995 when three uh, U.S. soldiers raped a 12-year-old girl in Okinawa, uh, causing outrage there and the largest protests ever against the U.S. in Okinawa. U.S. and Japanese leaders were forced to go on damage control, and they agreed to move the Futenma base uh, in Okinawa out of a heavily populated part of the island to Henoko. Uh, to create a new base in Henoko, but this uh, would later and still today is causing uh, problems as well. Today Japan has, uh, depending on the, the uh, year it's ranked and how it's ranked, between the 7th to 8th largest military, or it's the 7th to 8th largest military spender in the world, the defense budget, budget of roughly $42 billion. The JSDF has about 148,000 troops, uh, the ASDF Air Self-Defense Force is 46,000, Marine Self-Defense Force is 44,000, the GSDF gets 37.8% of the national budget uh, for military spending, right? Okay, now uh, let's look at some of the changes to the SDF under Prime Minister Koizumi.
so as I mentioned, uh, the U.S. or Japan provided a lot of monetary support for the Gulf War, um, and the U.S. from this time was uh, from the end of the Cold War seeking to uh, strengthen its alliances uh, with uh, nations that were friendly to its policies in order to facilitate its economic hegemony uh, in the Asia Pacific um, and to prevent the formation of other nations forming close ties with China in particular. So part of, again, when we look at Sino-Japanese relations, we have to remember um, that the U.S. is basically um, purposely trying to interfere or trying to prevent uh, the formation of close Sino-Japanese relations uh, as a part of its uh, uh, strategy to maintain economic hegemony in the region. This is roughly kind of the idea of acting as an offshore balancer. Um, and part of the other uh, side of acting as, a, as an offshore balancer means a military buildup of regional power so that they play off each other. So the offshore balancer would play these other powers off each other um, while at the same time you know, acting to ensure that none become powerful enough to challenge its own hegemony. The role of Japan in this, uh, as I mentioned, and as it has been uh, from very early on, has been to revise Article 9 to expand the FDS, uh, SDF and to act as a, quote, mini-NATO partner for the U.S. in the Pacific. The U.S. also hosted a missile, U.S. missile defense, or Japan would also host a U.S. missile defense program. Um, and preventing missile attacks was only a one aim of this. The other aim would be that the US SDF would have to become more would have to become updated to become operable with the U.S. command systems, and there would be more centralized control and info sharing. Japan was at first skeptical about U.S. ballistic missile defense, uh, but then uh, China deployed short-range missiles in the Taiwan Straits in 1995, and there was a launch of North Korean or North Korea launched a missile uh, over Japan in 1998, um, which changed the situation and. Uh, Japan began collaborative research on ballistic missile defense. Uh, Gavin McCormick has said of this quote, the particular wave of Japanese fear and hatred for North Korea has played a large role in the transformation of Japan's security policy. Um, so as we'll see, and as we often see in the news still today, uh, Japanese leaders will frequently play the North Korea trump card uh, to say, to argue for increased military spending saying that North Korea uh, poses a real and serious military threat to the security of Japan. Um, I think this is highly questionable, um, and I'm very skeptical of this. I, I do not think at all that North Korea presents that much of a threat, and certainly not enough to justify the amount of uh, military spending and buildup going on, uh, or at least for what Japanese leaders frequently argue for. Um, in, as I mentioned, though, the, uh, there was the SDF peacekeeping organization law in 1992. This allowed the SDF to support peacekeeping missions in Cambodia, Mozambique, and the Golan Heights, and East Timor. Uh, it required a widening of the interpretation of Article 9. Um, in 1997, revised U.S.-Japan defense guidelines broadened the SDF roles again. Now the SDF would provide repair to U.S. vessels, communications equipment, surveillance, intelligence, etc., in 1998, the U.S. security strategy document said that this would be defined on a case-by-case -case basis. So really following U.S. guidelines, what the U.S. needs, and you know how can the SDF support that, basically. Uh, furthermore, there was increased expansion since uh, the September 11th uh, attacks against the World Trade Towers and the following subsequent uh, quote, war on terror. Uh, Koizumi spoke out in favor of revising the Constitution at this time to make it easier for Japan to support the U.S. military in, 19, er, in 2001. During the Iraq War, Japan adopted the Terror Special Measures Law and sent 24 military ships, including an Aegis destroyer, uh, to the region. This provided fuel for U.S. forces. In 2003, Koizumi again promised unconditional support uh, for the Iraq War, even though there was no U.N. approval for this uh, war. <clears throat> the U.S. even sought further support for having the U.S. Uh, the SDF directly depo deployed on the ground, um, and so at this time, you know, Bush was really pushing for 
what he what we call what he would call you know boots on the ground quote boots on the ground he wanted Japan to, to you know um, actually send military forces and fight alongside the U.S. Um, and Koizumi pushed for this in, in the face of opposition um, within the Diet and uh, popular opposition. But Koizumi brushed off constitutional legal concerns in favor of quote common sense. He said the SDF should be called a Nihon Kokugun, basically Japan military or army. Uh, the decision to deploy the SDF was ratified in the House of Representatives by the end of January, but it was opposed by the main uh, Democratic Party of Japan and even some of uh, the LDP's own members. Gavin McCormick said of uh, this time, quote, uh, helped by the axis of fear and hostility toward North Korea, Koizumi had taken giant steps toward accomplishing the goal that previous conservative leaders had only dreamed of, setting aside 40 years of constitutional principle and transforming this, the SDF into a de facto regular army. 550 SDF troops were eventually dispatched to a region in Iraq um, and at great expense, taxpayer money, um, to maintain very lavish uh, military bases. Koizumi further tried to justify this dispatch um, by saying that the SDF was combined, confined only to non-combat areas, even though the dispatch in general was uh, technically unconstitutional anyway. Popular opposition to this move was very high, between 70 to 80 percent uh, in uh, mid-2003. Popular opinion partly improved in 2004 through promotional, um, through promotional campaigns emphasizing popular nationalism and patriotism, and um, government campaigns would also try to promote the humanitarian aspects of the SDF. Uh, in April 2004, three, th three Japanese were taken hostage in Iraq. They were on actual peacekeeping missions, and they were released one week later, but the victims were harassed when they returned to Japan for, quote, damaging Jap Japan's reputa reputation and being, quote, reckless. Since 9-11, Japan has paid $30 billion for U.S. bases in Japan, and this would be at the time that uh, Gavin McCormick wrote his article in 2004, so already this is a bit dated and this number would have uh, grown uh, uh, by a lot, but if we just consider, you know, 9-11 in 2001, Gavin McCormick writing with this data in 2004, it would be during a three-year period between 2001 and 2004. Uh, Japan paid $30 billion for U.S. bases in Japan, plus an additional $150,000 per U.S. soldier in Japan per year for 39,691 U.S. troops. It, almost, it also promised, Japan also promised to build a new base in Okinawa at Henoko for $9 billion, for a cost of $9 billion. The LDP tried to pitch this use of taxpayer money as protection from North Korea. Again, so here we see the strategic uh, uses of North Korea and why some conservative LDP leaders would portray it as a threat. Um, and let's see, um, and all of this monetary support for the Iraq war, by the way, um, it comes at a time of economic stagnation and a growing deficit um, through uh, increased, you know, printing of government bonds, which is, again, uh, all of the interest on that is paid through taxpayer money. Um, this was increasing dramatically. Koizumi covered up his U.S. subservience with uh, Japanese nationalism, as we saw in the case of uh, the last lecture on neoliberalism in Japan, which Koizumi also helped pioneer. Um, nationalism, again, played a very useful role in this, uh, in trying, in, is basically the only thing that um, uh, Jap elite Japanese leaders could offer the populace, in, even though in actuality, uh, they were gutting social services and increasing the military budget through taxpayer money. And Gavin McCormick writes, Up till now, Koizumi's nationalism has been more pose than substance, faithful to Washington on almost all issues, with a possible deviation on North Korea, he has sought to disguise himself with strong Japanese accents. The more he serves foreign purposes, the more important it is that he seem and sound the nationalist. But again, it's important to point out that this is not nationalism per se, since it relies on memories of past nationalism. And for instance, uh, visits to Yasukuni Shrine would be relying on uh, memories of 
past military sacrifice, past nationalism. So this is why many people say today this is a kind of neo-nationalism. Okay, let's look at the evolution of Japan's military policies in the SDF um, through the Abe period, Trumpism, and beyond. <clears throat> so starting with Obama's uh, pivot to Asia, in 2011, Obama and uh, Hillary Clinton announced this pivot to Asia or shift to Asia. This was a shift in U.S. military assets to the region, an extension of U.S. defense ties, increased U.S. military exports, more joint training and exercises. Um, it would also be an increase, an increased presence uh, by the U.S. Navy in the Asia Pacific from 50 to 60 percent by 2020. This included increases in Singapore, Australia, Thailand, India, Philippines, Indonesia, and Malaysia. Um, there would also be, as a part of this policy, an upgrading of existing bases in the Asia Pacific, including Korea and Guam. And in general, this was a period of increased military militarization around East Asia and the Asia-Pacific arms imports in East Asia surged from this time with China and Korea taking the lead and Japan playing a greater role as well. Meanwhile, the U.S. maintained a huge nuclear arsenal spending on this ar and spending on the U.S. Uh, nuclear arsenal greatly outstripped the rest of the world. Uh, the U.S. has over 1,000 foreign military bases. Uh, in contrast, China has none and f uh, maintains military forces in 134 countries it annually does 170 military exercises and 200 visits to the Asia-Pacific Asia region alone. Uh, to justify this, the U.S. presents China, has presented China especially as a, quote, threat, when in fact it continues to be, quote, probably the most secure great power in modern history, uh, the U.S., right? And um, here I'm uh, quoting research by uh, Scapa Tuda, uh, who says that, also, quote, uh, it's really U.S. hegemony rather than U.S. security, which is at stake. And as I've mentioned, the U.S. is seeking to maintain unhindered military domination in the Asia-Pacific. The main policy goals in the Asia-Pacific are to keep Asian nations divided to prevent challenges to U.S. hegemony, and thus attempt especially to prevent other Asian nations from forming alliances with Beijing. So we can see here, actually, this is pretty much a continuation of U.S. policy in a way uh, throughout the post-war. Uh, in April to, uh, 2012, the LDP, so now we're moving on to um, Prime Minister Abe Shinzo and his second uh, term in office. And in anticipation of this, in April 2012, the LDP released a draft constitution. So as I've mentioned, the LDP has sought constitutional revision uh, throughout the post-war since the end of World War II, um, seeking for uh, uh, constitutional revision so that it could maintain uh, an army. And uh, toward this end, the LDP released this draft constitution, Nihonko Kenpo Kaisei Soan. This proposed to change the status of the emperor from symbol to head of state, head the term is Genshu, uh, it commands that people, it really does command, and I'll show it the Japanese in a minute, it commands that people respect the national anthem and flag. The terminology used is soncho shinakereba naranai. Um, it proposes to revise Article 9 and to change the SDF to a, quote, national defense force in Japanese, kokubo-gun. But here this says defense force because drawing from this uh, kanji uh, bo, like fusegu, uh, fusegu but... Uh, note that the Japanese term uh, and the Chinese character gun here directly translates as army or military. In September 2000, so then Abe became prime minister from December uh, 2012, and in September 2013, he outlined the idea of Japan as a, quote, positive pacifist country, Sekyokuteki Hei Washugi, at the UN General Assembly. This is not really his idea, actually, as I mentioned, this kind of stems from Ozawa Ichido, uh, who ironically is with the opposition. Uh, the same year, rammed through, he rammed through a state secrets law, Tokute Himitsu Hogo Ho, which punished offenders for between five to, year, five to ten years in, with prison time uh, for publishing, quote, state secrets. This was a direct attack on journalists and popular press uh, for criticizing the government. Abe also formed a National Security Council based on the U.S. model. The core members would be the uh, Prime Minister, Chief Cabinet Secretary, and Foreign Defense minister Ministers. 
The role of the NSC was to strengthen executive power since they could conceal decisions from the Diet, and especially re it removed um, uh, exercise war powers, uh, so it allowed them to exercise war powers uh, without being examined by or subject to scrutiny by the Diet. And in 2014, um, the Abe cabinet dropped the ban on uh, Japanese companies exporting uh, weapons to foreign nations so that Japanese companies and weapons ma makers could benefit from selling weapons. In 2015, Abe tried to enact security legislation and to revise Article 9 to allow for, quote, collective self-defense, that what he called uh, collective self-defense in Japanese, shudan teki jieken. This would allow the SDF to fight alongside the U.S. abroad, and in anticipation of this, Abe met U.S. leaders in April 2015, where they discussed in Washington, where they discussed new defense guidelines, including collective self-defense in the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, it was again here. Then Abe is pushing the security uh, legislation at the behest of Washington. He meets with leaders in Washington first. They tell him, they give him the idea for this, and then he goes back uh, to uh, the Diet to try to push it through there. The U.S. wanted Japan to commit to U.S. operations anywhere in the world, but this would mean, of course, having to revise Article 9. Abe agreed to the legislation in Washington, then submitted bills to the Japanese Diet in May to allow the SDF to exercise military force outside Japan in concert with uh, allies, even if Japan was not under attack. So, really, this is expanding far beyond uh, the idea of even self-defense, which already is. We've seen the idea of self-defense. It's ambiguous whether or not that itself is constitutional. But a Nippon television survey found that 62%, 62.5% uh, 62 of people polled were opposed to collective self-defense. And uh, worse, for Abe in June 2015, 225 constitutional and other scholars signed a declaration of the illegality of Abe's security legislation. Moreover, scholars pointed out that the... Um, April U.S.-Japan uh, defense guidelines themselves were in contradiction of the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty, which stated that Japan could only deploy military in case of armed attack. However, Abe argued that Japan was, was in danger and that attacks on other countries threatened Japan, Japanese security. And uh, Lawrence uh, Repita write, wrote in 2015 of this, quote, the guidelines agreed in Washington on April 27, 2015, comprise the latest chapter in the saga of American interference in Japan's constitutional process. The invitation to Mr. Abe to make his proclamation in Washington, rather than Japan's own capital, shows a disturbing callousness and disregard for Japan's sovereignty. I want to just uh, look at two very short sections from uh, the beginning of uh, the LDP's uh, revised constitution draft. Now, this is um, their idea for how they want to revise the constitution. This has not been put into place yet, but if you go to the LDP website, you can find the draft of their constitution, and you can easily imagine, um, not even imagine, I mean, this is clearly spelled out by them that if uh, they did achieve their goals for revising the Constitution, um, that this is how uh, it would uh, look. And here's the section where it says, uh, Ten no wa nihon koku no o genju de yari. Uh, this part right here, the emperor is the head of the Japanese state. This is a change from the symbol of the Japanese state, which he is under the current Constitution. Um, here, Waga Kuni no Heiwa to Dokuritsu Narabi ni Kuni o Yobi Kokumi no Anzen no Kakuho Suru Tame Nai Kaku Sori Daiji no Saiko Shikikan to Suru Kokubo Gun no Hoji Suru. This section here says Japan will maintain a national defense force with the Prime Minister as Commander in Chief. So these are just some of the changes to uh, proposed changes by the LDP to the Constitution. Uh, and this draft was released in April uh, 2012, technically before Abe became prime minister. Uh, but as I've shown, um, Abe himself is not really an anomaly. Uh, he's basically just carrying on what have been Washington and the LDP's goals uh, from the end of World War II. There was a massive protest against 
um, Abe's security legislation um, and quite a bit of backlash against this, even though he did ram through the legislation successfully in the end. Um, in August 2015, for instance, 120,000 people protested the security le legislation outside the Diet. One of the main protest groups was the Student Emergency Action for Liberal Democracy, uh, or known by its abbreviated uh, SEALDS. They launched in May, or they started in May uh, 2015. Some students emerged from earlier anti-nuclear protests as well as protests against the state secrets law. Many SEALDS members were youth from private universities. Now this is different from uh, previous uh, student movements, and actually there's a lot of differences between SEALDS and previous student movements. The student uh, movements in the late 1960s with the Zankyoto Undo, as I've talked about in a previous lecture. Uh, the Zankyoto students were mainly centered at public universities, the two largest being Tokyo and Kyoto University. Um, and I want to point out that there is one major difference, especially in the economic, socioeconomic backgrounds of students who go to public and private universities in Japan. So this is one thing perhaps to keep in, in the back of our minds uh, when we think about SEALDS. Uh, Jeff Kingston writes that they argued to, quote, protect Japan's liberal democratic values and promote constitutionalism. Uh, this is a funny term that I think would uh, gain quite different meanings outside of Japan, but what they're really saying is, I think, basically just protect the Constitution, protect Article 9. Um, they purposely shunned, quote, radicalism and even left-wing or Marxist thought in general. And um, I I'll, I'll talk about in a minute how I think this is one of their greatest weaknesses and why probably they... Uh, were unsuccessful and essentially uh, disintegrated um, uh, shortly thereafter. But Okuda Aki, uh, one of the leaders of the movement, a 23-year-old student uh, at Meiji Gakuin uh, and founder of SEALDS actually insisted that, quote, if one government can change things just with their interpretation, then the constitution itself is altered and the government can do whatever it wants. And this is cited in Jeff Kingston's 2015 article uh, at the Asia Pacific uh, Journal of Japan Focus. Um, so I would say that SEALDS, you know, was very successful in wooing the liberal press, commentators and scholars, not just in Japan, but around the world, since they seem new, fresh, and young, and also because they never attempted to challenge the existing liberal capitalist order. Um, parallels were drawn between them and the protests in Hong Kong, uh, and they purposely were a staked out and essentially mainstream liberal position, um, which Kingston referred to as, quote, staking out the middle ground. So there's really, they de-emphasized the idea of them as being any kind of radical, as seeking anything radical. They purposely um, projected themselves as being middle of the road, liberals essentially, as centrists. Um, and all they were seeking to do is, is maintain this constitution against um, this kind of rightward, uh, authoritarian uh, trend that they saw taking place under the Abe uh, government. And I think this is why they received so much positive uh, popular attention, because they didn't really challenge things uh, from the beginning. But there's a major weakness with this, which I'll touch on uh, in the conclusion to my talk. Continuing on with um, some of the other changes under the Abe government, uh, the Abe and the LDP worked to construct a new U.S. military base at Henoko. I've talked about the background for this already with the 1995 uh, um, rape case in Okinawa. Um, and also continued to support the U.S. nuclear weapons ars arsenal and to oppose U.N. efforts to ban nuclear weapons. In uh, 2014, Japan refused to support the Vienna Conference on the Humanitarian Impact of Nuclear Weapons. And in 2016, Abe and Obama visited Hiroshima to call for a nuclear-free world, but this ignored actual, the actual efforts at the same time of the U.S. to modernize its nuclear arsenal and efforts by Japan that year to oppose banning nuclear weapons at the U.S. General Assembly. So... This Abe Obama visit also in 2016 re received a lot of positive uh, press, uh, hardly any critical press, in fact. Um, but in fact, this was just a symbolic gesture because if we look at what the U.S. and Japan were actually doing, the U.S. is devoting more money to its nuclear arsenal. If you look at Department of Defense documents from the time, which are made public, uh, they'll clearly uh, explicitly outline 
uh, you know, this increase in budget to modernize nuclear weapons. And if you look at what Japan was doing, it was voting against U.S. General Assembly um, resolutions to ban nuclear weapons. And this is especially ironic if you consider that Japan was bombed twice, um, the worst nuclear disasters in uh, history, uh, uh, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, killing hundreds of thousands of people. And this has since become a part of Japanese uh, identity and a basis for Japanese pacifism in the post-war. Um, but ironically, the LDP especially, but other Japanese politicians as well, support the U.S. nuclear umbrella uh, and continue to oppose uh, nuclear weapons bans. Okay, let's look at um, some of the changes that took place under the Trump administration. So this caused what um, some people have called a kind of Trump shock in Japan, but this wasn't really anything new. Um, many times liberal commentators like to portray both Abe and Trump as anomalies, basically. Um, but as a, an historian, um, I would very strongly argue and advise against this kind of characterization uh, because all they're really doing is, is carrying on um, previous policies that um, leaders, elite leaders on both sides had, had already been uh, implementing and advocating for. If we remember the earlier Nixon shocks, for instance, when Nixon visited China without informing Japan first, um, this caused a huge shock in Japan as well, but eventually uh, Japan got over it, and the U.S. Uh, Japan's uh, security alliance was maintained and expanded. Following the Gulf War, as I mentioned also, Washington has pushed for an even stronger commitment to militarily from Japan, um, Japan has faced strong U.S. pressure to, nor quote, normalize and hold a military. As O'Shea and Maslow wrote in 2020, the metaphor is that of the eggshell, within which Japan safely develops its military under U.S. protection. Trump did, though, develop this kind of st his style of Japan bashing in the 1980s. He decried uh, Japan's, quote, free ride, um, getting, you know, U.S. defense um, without giving anything in return, he thought. Um, this is patently false. Japan pays an exorbitant amount of money to main U.S. Uh, forces in Japan, but uh, Trump just, I mean, this is a lie, basically. He just tried to paint a picture of Japan as free-riding, free-loading uh, on the U.S. Trump also opposed the TPP and accused Japan of currency manipulation. It was a shock to Abe uh, and his cohorts because they, like much of the rest of the liberal media around the world, assumed that Hillary Clinton would win. Um, and so there was a lot of uncertainty when Trump, this guy who had previously, um, you know, pretty much badmouthed Japan for decades, uh, became U.S. president. Um, and right away, then, the first foreign leader to visit uh, Trump after he was elected was Abe, uh, who bent over backwards to wine and dine Trump um, through this kind of Gulf diplomacy in order to um, gain the assurance uh, that the U.S.-Japan Security Alliance would be, uh, that there would be no changes to this. And Abe even gave Trump a $3,775 gold-plated golf club as a gift. <clears throat> Nevertheless, Trump still abandoned the TPP, even though Obama spent years trying to get Japan just to join it. U.S. security advisors, however, assured Japan that, US, that the U.S. was indeed committed to the alliance. Um, Trump made overtures to North Korea, which frightened Abe, since North Korea, as I've shown, is basically his Trump card on defense. And in 2017, Abe then, so in order to kind of pacify Trump, basically, and to make it seem like uh, you know, to make, to make, to show Trump that, um, okay, well, Japan's willing to spend more. Um, in 2017, Abe then approved the purchase of U.S. Aegis Ashore Missile Defense System, although this was later canceled in July 2020. In 2018, he bought 115 F-35 stealth fighters, and as I said, the idea was to increase Japan's uh, spending on U.S. defense exports to make Trump happy. Trump, meanwhile, continued to make economic threats against Japan, urging to hit them with tariffs unless they accepted more U.S. goods, etc. Uh, Trump also demanded an extra $8 billion from Japan, otherwise he would pull out of the defense treaty. Yet, um, this was not all negative for Japan, for the Abe government, nor for the U.S.-Japan Security Alliance. 
Um, Trump did provide Abe with renewed momentum to implement his 2015 security policy changes. And also Abe's efforts to uphold the international liberal trade order, um, you know, kind of he, he seemed like he was upholding free trade, quote, free trade, whereas Trump seemed to be promoting um, autarky almost at times. Um, and this won Abe uh, a lot of fans in the international fans and praise in the international media. And uh, Joe Biden, now who has been declared president-elect, I guess, although could still be unclear what might happen, but uh, if Joe Biden uh, becomes president, which he likely will, we were likely to see a return to the strengthening of the defense alliance in a policy that, which is closer uh, to the policy adopted by uh, President Obama. Which brings me to the conclusion um, and some tentative conclusions to draw from this discussion in the history of post-war uh, Japanese remilitarization and, and the SDF. Uh, in the context, as we've seen, it's impossible to separate from the context of the U.S.-Japan Security Alliance. Um, and uh, that, moreover, this should be interpreted in the global context of the Cold War and post-Cold War. It also means that Japanese uh, domestic geo strategy should partly be seen in light of U.S. domestic policy, politics as well. Who is president in the U.S. and U.S. policies do greatly affect Japan, especially considering their, considering their very close relationship to the United States militarily. The U.S. helped write Article 9, but then after that it immediately sought to disown it, as did much of the LDP conservatives and the right wing in Japan. However, much of the Japanese public has embraced Article 9 and post-war pacifism as a part of its identity. This has uh, been evidenced in the strong opposition to Abe's security legislation in 2015, not to mention earlier examples of opposition to the Vietnam and Gulf Wars. At the same time, recent Japanese opposition, like SEALDS, contains unescapable contradictions. It seeks to return to a liberal capitalist world order which it feels is threatened by rightward authoritarian drift. Yet, it is this very order represented by the U.S.-Japan Security Alliance which has pushed for Japanese remilitarization in the first place. This is the biggest contradiction that SEALDS, I don't think, from the beginning would have been able to overcome. And the ironic part is that much of the opposition with the JDP that was supporting SEALDS, or at least rhetorically giving their support for SEALDS um, and speaking out against Abe, stated in their own manifesto that they wanted to strengthen the U.S.-Japan alliance. So um, this is why I think also it's a mistaken policy just to portray Abe as, um, as an anomaly um, and to, to pin all of these uh, policy changes and this rightward shift just on him. Um, just like Trump, um, Abe is not the cause of these things. He is a symptom of uh, larger uh, issues, some people would say problems, that uh, exist structurally in the nature of, in this case, Japanese politics and uh, geostrategy. Uh, the U.S.-Japan military alliance was able to weather the Trump storm. And there may have even been benefits for U.S. and Japanese weapons makers, for instance, and likely there will be a strengthening of the alliance under uh, Biden regime. Okay, so that is the end of my talk. Um, I hope you found this enlightening. Uh, I found it to be quite interesting. This was a great opportunity for me to kind of catch up on some research during that of events that have taken place in the last decade, especially. Um, that I've always, you know, kind of seen in the background going on in the news. Um, you know, I visited and went to um, not only many of the anti-nuclear protests, but also uh, protests against uh, the, the Abe's 2015 security legislation, since I was a grad student in Tokyo at this time. Um, and um, so I, I was very aware of these things, but this was just kind of doing this lecture was a good refresher I guess, and especially just to situate these things historically uh, as well in order to deepen, um, deepen my own understanding of this. So I've, I, I hope that you also have found this to be 
uh, enlightening and that maybe it will stimulate some of your own future research because I know that there's a lot of things that I did not cover in this talk. Um, hopefully I'll be able to do some of that in future lectures, uh, but today just specifically looking at uh, this period of history uh, through the lens of Japanese remilitarization and the history of the SDF. Thank you very much.